Well, one of the things that I have learned as uh, a Christian for, for several years, uh, for many years, um, uh, God's timing is different than ours. Can we say amen to that? Some yeah. Amen. Yeah. I've told you this story before, but it's one of the, one of the ones in my life that I think most uh, perfectly tells, tells this story. When I graduated from seminary, I attended, the seminary I attended, it was in Chicago. Um, my prayer that was that God would send me to a congregation um, that had a pastor who would be a fantastic mentor for me. I wanted to learn more. And as I interviewed in Phoenix, um, I sensed the Holy Spirit's leading very, very, very strongly during the, the interview weekend. Um, the Spirit spoke very powerfully to me during my early December interview uh, weekend when the temperatures hit about 70. And, and, and I was coming from... Did I mention that my seminary was from Chicago? <laughs> and, uh, and so... Needless to say, that went real well that weekend, and my starting date was just a couple months later, February 1st, 1990. Right out of the gate, I was busy with programs and preaching four services every other weekend, and I was also learning from this incredible mentor, incredible mentor. And to this day, so many of the ways that I do things, and uh, things were things that I learned from Pastor Bill, and he continues to be a great friend. And I I mentioned that I started on February 1st. Well, Pastor Bill announced on May 1st of that same year that he was accepting a call to another church. Oh, my. <laughs> the Spirit was evidently actively leading him, too. And just in, I wasn't in charge of the whole process. He, God was. And, uh, and so as of June of that year, my daily mentoring with Pastor Bill, at least the daily part of it, would, would be over quite a bit sooner than I had envisioned. And once again, God's time, timing is different than my timing. Pastor Bill assured me, he said, this is going to be for your growth and your benefit, I promise you, you're ready. And I remember leaving early, um, the same day when he gave me the, the news, when he announced his plans and thinking, God, what in the world are you doing? What in the world are you doing? I'll bet you, in fact, I can almost assure you that you've asked that question before too, haven't you? God, what in the world are you doing? It's my guess that many of us, most of us have had, every one of us have had many situations where our plans, the way we thought that life was going to go, the way we thought that life should go, they were changed by an outside force that we had no control over. We just simply didn't have a choice in the matter. And isn't that just simply a part of life? It's part, of the follower, it's part of the life of the follower of Jesus, too. And actually, when you think about it, we do have a choice, don't we? But the choice is not in whether it happens. It's the choice of how we respond to what has taken place. Now, I want to interrupt the story right here and take us to our text for today. And, and please take my situation that I just described to you and substitute Jesus as the mentor and uh, the disciples were kind of like me in, in, the, in, in the story. And, and just un try to understand how Jesus' disciples felt. They'd been with him for three years. And, and certainly, uh, Jesus would be the most incredible mentor that you could ever hope, hope to have. And uh, listen to what Jesus said to them in John 16. He said, but now I am going away to the one who sent me. And I bet you they didn't hear much after that, did they? <laughs> I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it's best for you that I go away because if I don't, the consular won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. A little bit later in this passage, uh, the disciples predictably asked, what in the world are you doing, Jesus? This is not a good thing. Uh, earlier in the evening, Jesus had com comforted this team of disciples with these words. He said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another consular 
who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be with you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. So Jesus says that the Spirit will be our counselor. And part of that is the Spirit will be our leader. The Spirit will be our, put in modern terms, he'll be our life coach. He'll be our, our mentor. Romans 8, 14, the Apostle Paul says these words. He says, excuse me, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So what does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? That's one of the, as we counted down the the many aspects, the, 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 the many roles that the Holy Spirit has in our lives, that's one of the most important ones. The Holy Spirit is our leader. Well, the, we're going to go through several observations this morning about what that means, but i uh, I, I, I hope we can bore down and make this very personal for you this morning. The first one is that mostly we think about the leadership of the Holy Spirit during intense situations, don't we? We think of the Holy Spirit being led by the Holy Spirit in intense situations. For instance, when I am troubled, when I'm in trouble, when I've lost my perspective, my prayers are, help me God, what is the, what's going on? Sometimes it's just one word, help. One word, help. There are really requests for the Spirit's guidance when I'm neck deep in alligators. Another intense time that we ask for help from the Holy Spirit, for leadership from the Holy Spirit, is when we're making a big decision. There's nothing like a crisis or a big decision, is there, to draw us closer to God. Second thing I observed is, this is the harder one for us to believe, is is, is God is much more about who we are becoming than what we do or where we go. In other words, what he is about is, is not so much um, what we think we're about. And that leads us to the third observation. God's will for us is to desire him more than we desire his answers for our lives. To desire him more than we desire the answers to whatever crisis we're in, whatever situation we're in. God doesn't want to just be our personal map quest or our GPS like we use our phone. Get me from point A to point B, God. He wants us to desire that relationship with him and grow in it every day. Fourth observation, God's will is that we listen every day to the Spirit's voice. We talk about this often through the scriptures, most importantly. And then the next three are important too, but not nearly as important as the scriptures. We listen to our hearts. We listen to friends and family. And we also look at the convergence of circumstances that are taking place in our lives. So let's break from the observations for a second. Um, those are some great principles, but even when I do those, how about you? Sometimes when I even feel like I'm listening really intently, I still find that the direction is kind of fuzzy. Ever been there? Ever been there on that one? I, th I think we all have on that one too. I thought that there was a great case study um, in the scriptures that are going to help us kind of get into this a little bit more directly. Even the Apostle Paul had real life struggles with decision making. We think of him as almost godlike. I mean, he wrote all that stuff that we've been reading for 2,000 years in the, in the New Testament, all those writings. But, but we're going to see that he was full of the same sort of dilemmas, the same sort of uh, 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 stressful, contra controversial sort of emotions and fears as he was trying to discern what was the right way to go. We're going to go to Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, Paul has been traveling a lot by ship. And uh, uh, one of his land stops, he meets with some leaders from the, the church in Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the churches that he had founded. And uh, he, he wanted to see them. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted to update them on his plans. And so we're going to pick up in chapter 20, verse 22. 
And when Paul's describing his plans, he says, And now I am going to Jerusalem, drawn there irresistibly by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit has told me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about God's wonderful kindness and love. Paul is convinced in his heart that the Holy Spirit was leading him to go to Jerusalem. But in this case, Paul's, Paul begins to get some conflicting counsel from some of his friends. We read on in chapter 21. It says, We landed in the harbor of Tyre in Syria, where the ship was to unload. We went ashore and found the local believers and stayed with them a week. These disciples prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. And when we returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including wives and children, came down to the shore with us. There we knelt and prayed and said our farewells, and then we went aboard and returned home. Have you ever thought that you had a strong leading? There was a strong leading from God, but confusion sort of begins to set in when friends or family really, who really love you disagree with you. Or even circumstances say, this is going to be a very hard thing. Are you sure you really want to go there? So who's right? Who's right? Sometimes it's hard to discern, isn't it? Now, we said before, and we'll say it again, the most reliable voice of the Holy Spirit's guidance is always Scripture. It's always Scripture. We know for sure that this is God's Word. Does Scripture say yes or no to what we're considering? If so, we need to follow that. And after that comes our hearts, our friends and family, and our circumstances. But what do we do when, when some of them seem to contradict one another and, and we can't even get a clear line from Scripture? How do we know the difference between a leading from the Holy Spirit and our own thoughts, our, our, our own ideas, even our own preferences. How do we get a clear leading from the Holy Spirit when there's a difference between that and even our friends and family, what they seem to say? Paul continues to, as he travels to Caesarea, another stop, and there he received even more and convicting counsel that going to Jerusalem would result in persecution and extreme difficulty. Even Luke, who accompanies Paul on this journey, and as the one who's writing this book of Acts, he said, even I tried to persuade Paul not to go. I really tried hard. What do you do? Put Paul's situation into today. Let's imagine one of your friends came to you at, after church and announced that he or she was going, to, was, was going to go to Africa, to the Sudan, to an Isla Islamic fundamentalist region to do medical missionary work. And your friend says that the Holy Spirit has guided this decision, but, but clearly the chances of arrest and, and persecution were high. Yet your friend says she or he is compelled to go. If you love that person dearly, how hard will it be for you not to keep from interpreting the circumstances, keep from interpreting the, the world and guide them in the opposite way? Luke records Paul's response. But Paul said, Why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. <laughs> For I am not ready, I am, I am ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but also to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And then Luke adds this. He said, When it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up <laughs> and said, The will of the Lord be done. What do you do when you're making decisions and just things are not lining up? Things are not lining up. Well, I think the first thing you do is you recheck Scripture and you keep going to Scripture. Make sure you're clear on what the Bible says and doesn't say about any decision you're making. The second thing I think you do is you need to look past circumstances. 
Look past the circumstances. Realizes that circumstances are often very fickle. They're often very fickle. There are some among us who want to read a, a, a sign from God in almost everything. If you can't find a parking place someplace, well, that means I'm not supposed to go. <laughs> you know how that goes sometimes. Or if you do find a parking place, that means I'm supposed to go to the donut shop. That's the way it works. Must be that. Circumstances all by themselves can be a very confusing indicator because circumstances change all the time, don't they? Circumstances are a moving target. The third thing I think that's the most important is counsel carefully. Counsel carefully. I'm talking about more when you're giving counsel to somebody else. Um, your counsel to somebody else, may be, you may be, need to be very careful about using phrases like, well, the Holy Spirit is telling me that this is what you should do. The Holy Spirit is telling me that this is what you should do. You might, you might be convinced, but it's wise to encourage a person with phrases something like, you know, this might be off base, but it seems to me that, or, or as I look at the situation, this is what strikes me, but, but test this against what you're hearing from God. Test this against what you're hearing from God. The fourth observation. Don't assume that easy equals right. Don't assume that easy equals right. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He asked his father, Father, is there any other way that we can accomplish this mission, your mission, other than the cross? Is there any other way? And the father made it very clear in spite of all that Jesus would face the next day, that this was the path. And this is the way that he needed to follow. Fifth observation. This is perhaps the one that sounds the most pragmatic, but the, it might be exactly the key. Slow down. Slow down. The best counsel when factors seem to contradict themselves might be to just slow down because honestly we're always in such a hurry we're always in such a hurry but god's not as we say all the, all the time god is never late and god's never in a hurry the sixth one balance wisdom and trust i got this many a while back from a, a pastor by the name of carrie Newhoff, who is a pastor in Ontario, Canada, go Canada, <laughs> and, and someone who I have found to be tremendously helpful. Um, he wrote that he often asks two questions when making tough decisions, and the questions seem to contradict each other, but listen to me as I explain this. The first question is, is wisdom killing my trust in God? Is wisdom killing my trust in God? Let me sort of parse this out for you here. Um, think about it. I've been a pastor for 29 years. Am I wiser today than when I started on my first day, uh, the one I described for you, February 1st of 1990? Well, maybe I'm not going to answer for you, ask you to. <laughs> Let's just say I hope a little bit. <laughs> I hope a little bit. But sometimes our experience can cause us to trust in what we have experienced, uh, what we think we know for sure, because this is the way it's always worked, rather than trusting God when we have a chance to, to use Peter to step out of the boat and grab Jesus' hand and take a step on some new waters. Understand what I'm saying? The more successful the more comfortable you are, the bigger money cushion you have, the more people you know, the longer you've been doing it, the more conservative you and I become. And I'm not talking about politics here. Just the more conservative you become in, in not willing, being willing to take a risk, to being less adventurous, even if it seems like it's from God. When's the last time you had absolutely no choice. You got 
pushed by outside forces for for something uh, for, for the, and and the only only way to do only way to work through this was to really trust God to really trust God we don't necessarily like those situations when they're forced on us because we like to be in control we like the control of all the uh, uh, all the all the components but yet there are those times when we look back and there are th these are the times when we can look back and we can draw strength for the next time because for the next big decision because we can say yes i remember so well when i felt out of control and had to trust god and god came through in a way that i had never dreamed about i am so glad i didn't try to force my way through that first question was is wisdom killing my trust in god the second question pastor newhoff tells us to ask is does my trust in god disregard all wisdom seems like the opposite of the first question but the opposite is also true we can have so much faith that we become reckless <laughs> we can become reckless a closer analysis of the object of that faith might reveal that my faith is more about my ego or my pride it could be about my insecurity or my desire to compete with somebody else and i feel a little behind the the eight ball could be just plain disobedience or irresponsibility is my trust in god consistent with the character of jesus yes or no that's a question that will always help us you know in this whole thing of choosing to follow jesus leading the holy spirit's leading in this decision process you might read the scriptures and you might listen for counsel and all the rest and and still be unclear wouldn't it be always nice if a plus b equals c just exactly like that but it doesn't always work that way and sometimes you've come to a that proverbial fork in the road and you have to make a decision am i going to go this way am i going to go this way what do you do well i think you make the decision make a decision and you don't do it in fear, but you do it in faith, and you do it with a prayer. God, I, I, I wish I didn't have to make this decision right now, but I, I'm making this decision because I trust you. I've honestly tried to listen to you. If it's wrong, I trust you'll show me that. And if it's right, I trust you'll show me that too. You see, God loves us. And he's not trying to play a game of hide and seek. He's not a trickster. He's not, God's just not like that. He's, he's loving. But sometimes God makes us, it gives us the freedom to make those choices. He gives us the freedom to make those choices. And if the Spirit has a specific leading, we will trust that he will make that known to us. The key is that God calls us to stay connected with him, to be connected in that ongoing conversation with him so that we have the opportunity to listen to him when he does speak now one thing for sure is i know that we're not going to do this right all of the time i sure don't <laughs> i sure don't it's not an exact science but hopefully we're learning and growing and that's as it should be isn't it we can use psalm 143 verse 10 as a frequent prayer Lord, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. See, it's a process. Teach me. We're trying to learn. And if we mess up, if we don't get all the factors just right, God, help me recover. Help me get to that right path. Ask forgiveness. And we can move on. This is a dynamic relationship that we have with God. And if we listen, we're going to hear God's voice. This is the adventure of a life under the leading of the Holy Spirit. I want to go back to my original story that I told you about my life almost 29 years ago. Um, as I opened the door, I mentioned as I opened the door of the church office that day, I, I decided to, to go off and, and uh, sort of take some quiet time 
Uh, I, that was the day that my mentor had announced his plans. And as I opened the door, I think God did something for me that was exactly what I needed because my eyes looked directly at the peaks of some of the, the mountains that are out there in the, to the north. And God immediately brought to mind the verses of Psalm 121 to me. And the verses go like this. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Does my help come from there? And the psalmist's implied answer is no. My help comes from the Lord, my God, the maker of heaven and earth. And he will not allow you to stumble. That was the word I heard. I heard that through the scripture that was, that was stored away. And, and, and God gave me that, that opportunity to see that, the vision of the, of the mountains ahead of me. And I spent extra time, as you might expect, with the Lord over, over those next several days. And in my heart, I listened to God's word. And when I was quiet, and, and, and I determined, or I should say, I just discovered that I knew that I knew that I knew that God had called me to be the pastor at this church, and I was supposed to stay. That year, that next year, as I uh, took over the reins as a, as a rookie pastor, was one of the most stretching years that I've ever had in my life. And as you know, stretching hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> stretching things hurts, but you grow. And I will always be very grateful for an incredibly patient congregation who taught me a lot what it means to lead and what it means to be a pastor in ways that I would have never been, have possibly experienced had my mentor still been there. You see, if you've trusted your life to Jesus Christ, then you have all of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You do. That's the promise that we have. That is that is, that is how it works. The question is, though, not is all of the Holy Spirit present in you. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? Does the question, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? Because the Holy Spirit wants to personally lead you. And my question to each of us this morning is, will we be honest with God? Will we really listen? Even when God's counsel goes against what my preferences are? And will we allow the Holy Spirit to have full access to us? Join me in a prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, I want you to have full access to my life. And I believe we all do this morning. We welcome your leadership in our relationships, in our workplace, in our playtime, in our thoughts, in our actions, in the places we serve, God, where you're calling us to serve, and even in our words. We invite you to be present 100% of the time. Thank you for your desire for that for us too. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.